beautiful room, Fassett Hall and Hamilton Hall. Hamilton Hall was constructed in 1925 to house the library of Elmira College. And this space where you're to tonight was the central reading room. I always like to contemplate that and invite you to imagine young women here at oak tables, diligently studying in this room. When students visit us today, they say it's very Harry Potter-like. Yes. <laughs> but regardless, Fassett Hall is really a lovely place for events, and I'm so happy we could gather here this evening. Um, as our program states, and many of you are holding it, hopefully have read it, this November 30th, today, is the 176th birthday of Samuel Langhorne Clements. That's why you're here. <laughs> born, he was born two months premature in 1835 in Florida, Missouri. No one expected him to live. But live he did, ultimately changing the course of American literature. Well, for our speaker this evening, I am so very, very pleased to welcome Dr. Cindy Lowell. She is the Executive Director of the Mark Twain Boyhood Home and Museum in Hannibal, Missouri. Probably read that in your program. And she is a wonderful woman. <laughs> I didn't write that in but I can tell you. You'll only get a short glimpse of her tonight. But I have known her for years now. And I want you to know that Cindy serves Mark Twain studies with boundless energy, creativity, and with amazing love for this man, Samuel Langhorne Clemens. The CD set she produced and will highlight tonight is only one small aspect of all that she so generously does to support the study of Mark Twain, not only in Hannibal, but in all of Mark Twain's sites. After Cindy's presentation tonight, she will take some questions and comments until about 8 p.m. At that point, we will break for the birthday cakes in the back and for punch. And I will remind you that copies of the CD set are available for purchase in the rear of the hall, should you desire. Please join me now in warmly welcoming Dr. Lowe. so much. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. It's a chilly, cool night out there, and yet you came out, and I'm very grateful, and I'm very humbled to be here. I, I cannot really fully express my love for Sam Clemens and my gratitude and all the people who worked so hard, Barb included, to preserve his legacy, and uh, just the good fortune of my life to just stumble along as I have and to end up here with you tonight in Elmira in this beautiful building with so many uh, wonderful people. I'm, I'm just deeply moved to be here. I, I just cannot put into words how happy this makes me. Uh, this CD project uh, has been so much fun to work on. I'm very eager to share with you all the stories of it and sort of the behind the scenes stories. Uh, but I have to tell you it began a long time ago. I guess you could say it began um, you know, on this date, on this date, 1835, when our fellow was born, and of course, Libby's birthday was just three days ago, and she plays a starring role. Uh, what a life, you know, what a life, and what an impact, and what a legacy. And of course, in Hannibal, we preserve eight old buildings, and uh, curate many artifacts, and I always say, we get those bad winds out there, those tornadoes, and I always say, if a tornado came along and took every building, even the boyhood home, it would break our hearts but his legacy would be safe because he preserved it so well in his own words. His words have, have shaped us and have changed us and have made us better people. And for that, I'm so grateful to Sam Clements. He certainly has been my hero for many, many years. Uh, for my own part in this story, uh, it really began when I was 10 years old and I was a very lucky kid. I grew up without a television in Pennsylvania, just a few hours south of here in York County, lived on a farm. And so I read a lot, and we played music, we played bluegrass music, and there is a distinction between bluegrass and country, as you know. And we were not allowed to listen to anything but pure bluegrass. And my family played, and it was, it was wonderful. I had a wonderful childhood on that farm. 
But the, the person who really started it was my fourth grade teacher. And today I had the privilege to visit the Thomas Edison High School here. I got to meet with four different ninth grade classes. They were wonderful students and asked wonderful questions. It was so exciting to be with kids who were, you know, learning about Mark Twain and reading about, reading his work. But for me, it started in my fourth grade class, and I had an amazing teacher who never read us an entire book. Never. He never read us an entire book. Instead, he set out the bait in a way that I think Sam Clemens would approve of and Tom Sawyer himself might have employed. What he did was every day, he would choose a different book, and he would read one chapter. Now, he didn't just read it. He would pause, and he would explain, and he would put it into context. So on the day he selected Tom Sawyer, and he put that whitewashing chapter into perspective for all of us little fourth graders, he changed my life. I was the oldest girl in a very large family. I had a lot of chores, and I couldn't understand why my little sisters didn't do as much as I did. And here was a fellow showing the way. <laughs> I had only to make them desire to wash the dishes and to show them how much fun it was with all the bubbles and what might they offer me in exchange for the privilege. So Tom Sawyer was a wonderful story for me as a little fourth grader. And what Mr. Reese did, <coughs> my teacher, was he would do this and then he would sort of dangle the book and he would say, and there it is, this book is called The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. Well, we would all make a beeline to get our hands on the book, whatever the book was, and then we would have a list. There were 35 kids in his class and it would take a while for that book to make the rounds. But I got my hands on Tom Sawyer too sweet, and it was the first time I discovered the joy of rereading a book. Because I got to the end, and what does Mark Twain say? So ended this chronicle of being the story of a boy. No, no, they just found the gold. What next? What next? I had no idea he was famous. I had no idea he had written some 30 books. All I knew was Tom Sawyer. So I went back to the beginning. Tom! No answer. Tom, still no answer. And I was in love with Tom Sawyer, and I read it over and over and over. Luckily, I, got, I made it to junior high. I survived elementary, made it to junior high. And my first week of school, I wandered into the library, and I cornered the librarian, and I said, do you have any books by a guy named Mark Twain? <laughs> <laughs> That's what she did, Jules. She laughed and, and very graciously went in the back, and she brought out a little volume that had Tom Sawyer, a detective, and Tom Sawyer abroad, stolen white elephant, encounter with an interviewer. It was a treasure chest of stories. And then I knew there was more, there was much more. And I don't have to tell you, you've read Huckleberry Finn. Huckleberry Finn changed my life. I never saw the world the same way ever again. And even as I reread it as an adult, it changes me every time. It makes me a better person when I read Huckleberry Finn. So it began for me a long, long time ago, this love I had of Mark Twain. Now I had, I tell the kids in school, I say, make sure you have a passion, and I get them to share with me, what is your passion? Sometimes they know, and sometimes they haven't found it yet. And accidentally, thanks to Mr. Reese, my teacher, Mark Twain became my passion. And the other passion I had was teaching. I always wanted to be a teacher. I didn't know there were so many rules to being a teacher. For instance, you have to first graduate high school, and then you have to go to college. <laughs> Well, for a fan of Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, this seemed like an awful lot of busy work. <laughs> After all, I had played school with my younger siblings for years, and I assure you, I knew how to take kids on a field trip. <laughs> That's what I did when their interest waned. I would cart them up through the farm and say, let's have a field trip, and then we would go. Well, I did do the, um, the long road home. When I was a junior in high school, I was sufficiently bored as to uh, declare myself uh, unsuitable for further education, and I dropped out of high school. So I took a very long road home, and now I tell my college students that my PhD stands for post-high school dropout, which <laughs> I am. And, and part of that was the fact that this young, young boy, Sam Clements, had left school at such an early age, and yet he went on to become Mark Twain after all. He didn't have that formal education. So I thought, well, I don't really have to have that, do I? But I did. I needed that. So in my 30s, I decided, I had an epiphany one day, and decided that was it. I was going to become a teacher. So I am probably the luckiest person I've ever met. And you may all touch me for good luck or shake my hand or anything you want, because I get to teach and I get to twain. <laughs> and what could be better? I have the perfect life. I was living in Florida, this was a few years ago, living in Florida, I was teaching at my alma mater, Stetson University, 
and loving it. Life was good. I was in the teacher education department, and life was good. I was enjoying myself. But I had one eye on the calendar. 2010 was coming. This was a few years ago. We all know what 2010 was. This was the big golden year of Mark Twain, all these wonderful anniversaries. And I kept thinking about it and thinking about it. And I wanted, I desperately wanted to do something. What does that mean? What do I do? What do I, what can I do? What can I add that hasn't already been done? The most wonderful books are written. The stories of his life, autobiographies have been edited. All this work has been written. What could I possibly contribute to, to help preserve his legacy and to honor him? And I taught a lot of young, I still teach a lot of young children. I, I do a Mark Twain Young Authors Workshop. I've taught many, many summer programs on Mark Twain for young students, and I love that. But I wanted to do something for more people than just my young authors. So I thought and thought about it. And a, I had a childhood friend from my bluegrass days of growing up. Now, I had not seen this childhood friend since I was about 15, so a few years had gone by. He was a banjo player. And when we met, he was 14 and I was 12. You can see the attraction. He held a banjo. <laughs> and we became pen pals. This was back pre-internet. So we didn't have, uh, you know, we didn't have any other means to communicate. We wrote old-fashioned letters to one another. And of course, every time his band was going to be anywhere near our vicinity, I would beg my parents and we would go and, and see him. So I hadn't seen him in many years, but I had followed his career. His name is Carl Jackson, and he's not a household name, but he should be. In the, in the world of music, and, and especially in Nashville, he's a very beloved name, but uh, he's, he's not a household name, and I don't know why. But Carl had produced um, and won Grammy Awards. He produced a number of albums and, and recorded many on his own. And one album in particular really resonated with me. It was an album he produced in 2003. It was a tribute to the Lubin Brothers. Is anybody in here familiar with the Lubin Brothers? couple heads nodding. Um, great classic blue, old, old beautiful bluegrass harmony. Uh, they're no longer with us and Ira Lubin had died many many years ago when I was a child but Carl produced a tribute CD and he brought these fantastic voices in to make this CD and he it was all duets so he picked their songs and he brought in these beautiful voices. One of the Grammys he won was for producing uh, James Taylor and Alison Krauss sang a, a, a duet on this album. And it had other great names. It had Dolly Parton and Johnny Cash and Merle Haggard. It was a wonderful, beautiful piece of work. But what I especially loved about it, he had little pieces of narration every now and then. And what it was, he had located some old footage of the Lubin brothers on stage introducing their own work. So this kind of blended throughout with the music. And I, I was fascinated by it to hear them on stage and speak. And I thought, oh, if only we had a recording of Mark Twain's voice. If only. Now we do have Hal Holbrook, and I will say that is the next best thing, and I'm sure you will agree. So we have Hal Holbrook, and so slowly this idea began to come to me. What if we could have a little spoken word, a little song, and in the course of this, tell Mark Twain's life. Tell it to a whole new audience. Tell it to people who aren't necessarily rushing to the shelf to read read Huckleberry Finn. People who just like a good story, or who like an audio book, or who like some good music. So the idea kind of, kind of began to bubble around in my head a little bit. But there was just one problem. I had no idea how to contact Carl Jackson, and he was the one that I knew had to produce this CD project. I just knew he had to. I mean, if you ever hear, get a chance to hear this Lubin project, you will love it. You can go on Amazon, look it up, and trust me, you will, you will treasure this album. It's just a beautiful piece of work. But I thought, well, I'm going to have two wishes here. One is that Carl Jackson will be the producer. And the other is Jimmy Buffett will somehow be involved. Now, do we have any parrot heads in the audience? Oh, yeah. All right. Can't go anywhere and not find a few parrot heads. But Jimmy Buffett, I always suspected, was a Twain fan. I suspected it from when I was 17 and first began listening to him because he's such a troubadour and he tells stories about the world and other cultures and people. And I just thought he must read Mark Twain. He must love Mark Twain. And of course, in 1986, he, or 88, I think it was, he recorded his first song where he actually mentioned Mark Twain by name. And he has written three songs about following the equator. In all of Jimmy Buffett's books, he writes about Mark Twain. He has a horse named Mr. Twain. He flies to the ocean. It's wonderful. So I thought, well, if I'm ever going to make a wish, I'm going to make it a big one. I'm going to wish that I can get Carl Jackson somehow involved and wish for Jimmy Buffett to be involved. And I think if that will happen, everything else will kind of fall into place. So... Having said that, uh, 
it happened. As you know, and that's what I'm here to talk about tonight, this whole big wish came to fruition. I made a phone call, got Carl Jackson's phone number from a mutual friend, and after nearly 40 years, I made the phone call, and he answered the phone. He remembered me, and he loved the idea of the Twain CD, otherwise I wouldn't be here tonight, you'd have a different speaker. <laughs> he said, I like this idea. He said, now I'm really busy right now, but let's go ahead and plan on it. We'll put it on the back burner. I've got to finish up some few things. Well, there was no back burner for me. The first thing I did was push off all my grading to the side, and I began to write the script for this CD. And what I ended up writing was the narrative, where I wrote narration, which you will hear Garrison Keeler doing the narration, and I chose the Twain part. So we have Twain's voice, we have Huckleberry Finn's voice, and these three folks are the main narrators of the story. And it literally is a double CD that Twain tells Twain's life from birth through death in spoken word and song. It's a very straightforward, easy idea. I just wanted to be very user friendly and engage people. And uh, that's how, that's what it is. It's, it's simply that. And what I'd like to do is play for you the very introduction of how this CD will sound. How many of you have actually heard it? Oh, good. Just hardly anybody. This is wonderful. <laughs> so I'm going to play it. I'm going to just, this is what you'll hear when you open it. Dusty, if you would please. You don't know about me, but that you have read a book by the name of The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, but that ain't no matter. That book was made by Mr. Mark Twain. He told the truth mainly. There were things which he stretched, but mainly he told.
was Emmy Lou Harris singing that song, if you didn't recognize that voice. And as you heard in the opening, we had Clint Eastwood as the voice of Mark Twain, and Jimmy Buffett as the voice of Huckleberry Finn, and of course Garrison Keillor, America's storyteller today, as our narrator. And that's how it begins. And what I set out to do was to write this narrative and then find songs that would go with each segment of the story. So, of course, you heard an old Mary Chapin Carpenter song there about Halley's Comet. She actually wrote that song about another author who was born under the comet, and that was Eudora Welty. And I just thought the song was so great. Now, I deferred to Carl on things musical, and we agreed back in the day when we began this that we would just start listening to songs. So, several years ago, I started listening. I put my family to work listening. I just had radar going everywhere I went. I was trying to hear songs that would fill in and tell stories of Mark Twain's life. On this project, we found many perfect songs. We thought they were just perfect songs for each of these little story segments, but not always. And so we ended up having to actually write a lot of new music for this. Now, luckily, Carl Jackson is an award-winning songwriter, so that helps a lot right there. And a lot of his friends got involved writing songs, and you'll hear a lot of nice original music. But one song in particular, uh, there are a lot of funny little stories behind the CD. One night I had my family all gathered in Pennsylvania, maybe two years ago, and I had the script written, and I had uh, a lot of the songs selected that I thought I was kind of, if not married to, I was at least engaged. And, uh, but I wanted them to hear it, because they have good ears, and I wanted, their, I wanted their feedback. And I'd been sending this script around, having people read it, and giving feedback. So that night we all sat around in the living room, and I literally read the project from beginning to end, but at each stopping place where I would stop the narration, I would play the song that I had penciled in, if I had that song, by, some, by someone else, some other recording. So we did the first one, and that's what you heard, although we played the Mary Chief and Carpenter song that night. Uh, the second one was as we get up to uh, we get to the next part of Sam's life, which is of course growing up in Florida, going to his uncle John's farm, and there's that beautiful description of the food that they eat and you know farm life. And we ended up using an old bluegrass song called "Better Times Are Coming," and I love the refrain because it's, it really reminds me of my own childhood, not just Twain's, because he says, "Put more water in the soup. There's better times to come." And in these hard times, I think that kind of song is appropriate. But it's a fun song. It's very uplifting, and I enjoy it. But when we got to the third section, this third story section, was about the Mississippi River. I live in Hannibal now. I didn't at the time. I had been visiting Hannibal quite a lot. But when you live in Hannibal and you see that Mississippi River day in and day out, mm -hmm. you get to the point where you just know Mark Twain was right to be proud of that river. You know how everywhere he traveled, he offended everyone's river that he ever met. Uh, he couldn't keep his thoughts to himself. Why well, he met one river one time, he said, that river? He said, I wouldn't call that a river. He said, I wouldn't leave that out all night where any dog could come along and lap it up. <laughs> so we knew how he felt about that river. And I wanted our song about the river to be very special. So we got to that segment. I was lamenting this to my, my sisters and my, my family. And I said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I have a couple of songs here. But what I heard in my imagination, I heard a very hard driving pounding banjo, bluegrass, the force of that river, that's what I heard. And I even thought about Rhonda Vincent. If you know bluegrass music, she's sort of the queen of bluegrass music, and her voice just booms. And I thought, gosh, if we just had a Mississippi River song, if some song could fall out of the air, but I knew I was going to be looking for a while. So I went on that evening, and I read all the other little stories and the songs and so forth. And that night when we finished up, and I had gathered up all their feedback from the family, uh, everybody went their separate ways, and my sister went home, and I stayed there at my niece's. Well, about an hour and a half later, I got a text from my sister, and she said, Are you still awake? And I said, Yeah, yeah, what's up? She said, I think I just wrote your Mississippi River song. And by golly, she said. <coughs> so I'm very proud that the third track, the third musical track on here, it's called Run Mississippi, and it is powerful. And my other little wish came true. Rhonda Vincent agreed to sing it. So we have Rhonda's voice on the CD as well, which is pretty stunning. She's going to be performing it at the Grand Ole Opry on December 10th. So if you tune in and listen to the Ryman online, uh, you can hear Rhonda singing it live that night. And she's going to do a little signing over at the um, Ernest Tubb record shop that night. But this is how it began. And it became uh, serendipitous in so many different ways. Carl went to work talking to different people. Now, when our paths had parted as teenagers, they parted because the little bluegrass group he was with, Jim and Jesse and the Virginia Boys, uh, was looking for somebody old enough to help drive the bus, 
And Carl ended up being snatched up by Glenn Campbell. He worked with Glenn Campbell for 12 or 13 years. And then he ended up uh, touring with Emmy Lou Harris for years. He toured with Vince Gill, Linda Ronstadt, and many great people. And so he knew a lot of people. I knew Carl would match the song to the voice, and that's how he works. He hears a song, and he hears that voice in his head. And he's got perfect ears, and he's a perfectionist. And everybody who works in a project, they all have little nicknames, but my favorite is from the Church Sisters. Now, I'm, I'd be very hard-pressed if anyone in here, has anybody heard of the Church Sisters before tonight? Well, after this CD, I'm hoping a lot of folks will hear them. Carl said, now, Cindy, I'll bring good names to this, but I'm bringing good voices. Mainly, that's my goal, is to bring good voices. So I've got some people in mind. And sure enough, he brought these little Church Sisters in. They are fraternal twins, these little 14-year-old girls, with voices this big, and they sang a duet on here that goes with the story segment where Sam and Libby fall in love, and it's just beautiful, and their voices are huge. Well, I got to meet these little girls down in Nashville after the fact, after the CD was recorded. I wasn't there for their session, but you know what they called the recording session they did with Carl? Carl Jackson's Torture Chamber. Oh. <laughs> because Carl's a perfectionist. And they would lay down their tracks over and over and over. And these little twins and singing this beautiful harmony. And the one has this high angelic voice. Then you have to pronounce every word and every syllable. And you have to hit every note. And I watched Carl work. I went down to the studio and watched. And he will, And it doesn't matter if you're Brad Paisley. He's going to make you go back and pick it up and do it again until it is perfect. And I'm so happy that he is the producer on this because of the perfectionist he is. So these little girls succumbed to Carl Jackson's torture chamber and they did their tracks. So he brought in a few people like this, uh, where, like I said, they're not big famous names, but he, he did bring in some names that you've heard of, no doubt. Vince Gill uh, is a friend of Carl's and he came on board and sang a song. Ricky Skaggs, um, Emmy Lou, we talked about, Brad Paisley. You, did you know that Brad Paisley has a son named Huck? <laughs> Well, I knew that. I, I, I like to keep tabs on Mark Twain fans. I wasn't, I shouldn't say this on film, but I wasn't, a, I wasn't real familiar with Brad's music at that time. I'm much more familiar with his music now. But I did know that Brad Paisley had a son named Huck. So I called Carl one day because we had a song can't come to us in just the most <coughs> magical way. Two teachers who come to our museum's teacher workshops. Every summer we offer teacher workshops that are a week long. And these two teachers have been coming to Hannibal for several years, Emily Hayes and Danny Wilson. They love Mark Twain. And you know how we are. We're all in this special We Love Mark Twain club. And we like to hang out together and talk about our favorite Twain passages and read to each other and elbow each other. And we love that. And they came for everything, not just the teacher workshops, but they would travel back up three and a half hour drive from Carbondale, Illinois. And they would come and for every little program that we had. And, uh, one night we were having dinner and I was mentioning that we were beginning to work on this CD project. And they finally got up the nerve to say, well, we write songs about Mark Twain. Well, I've been dying to meet somebody who writes songs about Mark Twain. I said, well, I must hear them. So we went down to the museum. It was late in the evening and we sat on Huck Finn's raft there at the museum and with some dim light we, we heard the songs that they had written. And one song was called Huck Finn Blues. And it's written in the first person as though you know, it's, it's Huckleberry talking about his path and talking about the adventures with, uh, with, with Tom Sawyer. And uh, it's just this wonderful, beautiful song. And I sent it down to Carl, and he reworked the music and some of the lyrics. And presto, we ended up with this fantastic song. But now who to record it? So I said, Carl, have you heard of this guy, Brad Paisley? He has, a, he has a son named Huck. He might want to sing Huck Finn Blues. I didn't know if the voice would match the song or not. I knew Carl would know that. He said, yeah, Brad's a friend of mine. He said, I had that same idea. Well, I went down to the studio the day Brad Paisley recorded this song. And Brad told me this himself. He said that he got the demo from Carl, and he played it about halfway through, and he didn't even, he didn't even wait to hear the whole song. He got on the phone, he phoned Carl. I said, I want to do this song. Carl said, that's the idea. Thank you. That's what we were hoping. And Brad told me, he said, well, he said, I thought about it. I thought, probably should have waited until I heard the whole song before I agreed to do it. And I thought, well... As long as they don't kill off Tom Sawyer or something, I'm sure it'll be fine. So luckily they didn't kill off Tom Sawyer in this song. And it is a beautiful song, and Brad did a wonderful job with it. We're so proud. So we've got Brad Paisley. We've got 
Uh, Doyle Lawson and Quicksilver, for all of you bluegrass fans, did a song. Of course, Rhonda Vincent did Run Mississippi. Another new artist on it is a young man named Bradley Walker that you will be stunned. The song he did is a brand new song of called Cowboy and His Soul. It goes with the Western years when Mark Twain was out in the Wild West, and it's a beautiful song. Uh, we've got Carl Jackson himself wrote a song called Safe Water. As he read the script and he became more engrossed in Mark Twain's life, and he began reading about Mark Twain. And he was fascinated with uh, the passage that I had put in about Mark Twain seeing Athens by moonlight. You recall on Innocence Abroad when they sneaked ashore. They were quarantined and forbidden to leave the ship. But you know our Sam, he sneaked ashore anyway. And he described how they went and saw Athens by moonlight, the citadel and all this. And uh, Carl loved that line and he loved the story. And he wrote a song called Safe Water. He recorded that on the CD. So then the church sisters sing a song about Libby and Sam meeting and falling in love. And then we get to what? The very happy family years. You all recall Miss Susie Clemens wrote a biography about her dad called Papa. One of my favorite books of all time. And it's just a you know, pure labor of love. And so I thought, we really need that perspective of Susie in there. So we have a little tiny bit of Susie. And I'm happy to tell you that the voice on that is a young lady named Angela Lovell. And yes, she is related. <coughs> She is my daughter. We paid her a whopping one dollar for her efforts, and there will be no royalties to her, so there's none of that business going on. Uh, this, is a, this, is, this is for the museum that we did this. So Angie did the little voice of Susie, and this is the family years that we're talking about. And then it goes into, and this was a song I just kept hearing. I kept saying to Carl, I just hear Beautiful Dreamer in this segment. And I don't know why, but I heard it a cappella. That was what I just had in my head. And that's what we ended up with. We have Cheryl Crow singing Beautiful Dreamer a cappella for this segment. So that's, that's the first CD. Uh, the second CD goes into the other half of his life, and you know that story. Uh, we begin where he talks about Elmira. He talks about, uh, you know, Quarry Farm and writing up here. And we have that beautiful quote by Tom Edison when he says that the average American loves his family, and if he has any love left over for anyone else, he generally selects Mark Twain. So we included that, and Brad Paisley's song then is played, this Huck Finn Blues. From there we go into the, you know, kind of the rough stuff where uh, we are facing bankruptcy and we've got to go travel around the world. Now I have to tell you, Following the Equator is one of my favorite books, and I know it's one of Jimmy Buffett's favorites. And I don't know if you've read it recently, but if, if so, do you recall the passage about the Indian crow? Does anybody recall that passage? It is so compelling. Mark Twain's in India. He was enchanted by India. This was a place that um, just was magical to him. He'd read the Arabian Nights as a boy, and there was something about India that really, he was fixated on this country. But the crows fascinated him. They would come in the morning and make so much noise and chatter. They were just obnoxious, but he loved them so much. He wrote about the, the crow. He said, the Indian crow has been reincarnated more times than Shiva. And, and each... Incarnation has kept a sampling of its other uh, origin. So he listed all these former occupations of the Indian crow. A liar, a blackguard, a scoffer, a dissolute priest, a hypocrite, a democrat, a patriot for cash, on and on and on. Oh, a, a, a rebel. He gets down to the very end, he said, and, and, and someday he'll come back again as an author or something. <laughs> And I, I had to put that passage in. Now, that was the beauty of getting of writing the project. I got to pick which passages, and I had to have that. Now, what are you going to do for a song about an Indian crow? Well, this is where it's nice to have all these songwriters on board. They wrote a brand new song called Indian Crow, and Marty Raven sings this song. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with his voice, but it's perfect. He was the lead singer for Shenandoah, if you know that group, so you know his voice really fits this song. And when they were in the studio recording it, he was singing the lines, and he's singing all these occupations, you know, the lecturer, the rebel, the reformer, and at one point he kind of lost his place, and he said, et cetera, et cetera. And it was so perfect, they went with the song, and they just rewrote that line and left it in. So when you hear that in the CD, you'll hear that, you'll know that's Marty in the, in the studio kind of losing track of this big list of, of positions that, that the, the pro had held in form of life. But we know what happened uh, at the end of this. Uh, they sail the guild for England. They're going to get things back on track. And the, the cablegrams begin. And this is where we lose Susie. And it's very heartbreaking. And one day I just happened to be out walking and listening uh, to some little folk station. I heard a little song I'd never heard of before by a woman named Grace Griffith. I'd never heard of her. But this song had a line in it that just stopped me in my tracks that day. 
see the little baby in her mother's arms. Daddy was a shelter, keeping her from harm. I just froze in my footsteps because we know how Sam felt about that, how he felt so responsible. He had put the family into the financial dire straits that they had faced and sent them off into exile to lecture and get the money to pay off this debt. Something about that line just grabbed me. And well, I didn't know the song, I didn't know the singer. I had to wait a whole week for this little folk station to post a playlist. I was Googling all over the place trying to find this song, and I finally did. And the young lady who sings it on our CD is named Val Story, and she has such heart and soul when you hear it. I dare you not to cry. It's where you're going to need some Kleenex when you get to this part of the CD. From there, we move on to the next segment. And remember, we can't tell the whole life in every detail. Boy, do I wish it were a triple CD or a quadruple CD. It would have been a lot more fun to include a lot more things. But we move on to the track where he loses Livy in Italy. And behind all of this narration, you'll hear some really beautiful music. Carl is an award-winning songwriter for a reason. He heard those words, and he would write original music to play behind it. And it, it fits so perfectly to the narrative. Uh, when they're in Italy, you hear this little Italian music playing. Uh, when the story about the little girls, he wrote a little piece called The Little Creatures. And it's just so playful, like little children playing. And when you get to the, to the, the part where Libby dies, um, we have a song that Vince Gill sings. And it's an old Eva Cassidy song that, again, will bring a few tears to your eyes. Well, we move on up and we get to those years where all the energy is now poured into social commentary. He had opinions, and by golly, he was going to express them. And it was wonderful to write this segment, but we just didn't have a song to fit. Nothing fit. We listened, we looked, we couldn't find a song. So the songwriters got together, and they wrote, a, a, I think, a masterpiece. It's called Ink. Ink. That was our guy, right? The power of the pen. The pen warmed up in hell. And in this song, the chorus, the refrain goes, I used to think it was the muddy water flowing through my blood. No, it was ink. And it's about that. It's about how he had so much to say and he had to say it. So this is the storyline. We finally get to the very end. And Carl was also fascinated. Remember, he learned a lot about Mark Twain for this project. And of course, we all know about Halley's Comet. Today, when I was at the high school, we talked about it. How, you know, what a coincidence that he had come in under the comet and... And when he died, he went out under Howie's Comet. And this fascinated Carl, just as it fascinated the school kids. And everybody who hears it the first time, they, you know, they're very captivated by that story. So the more Carl thought about it, the more he thought of a song. And I'll never forget one day, I was at my Lions Club meeting there in Hannibal at the Golden Corral. I came out, and my phone was ringing. I said hello, and this was often the case for making a CD. Carl would phone, and I would pace because I had so much energy coming out of my fingertips, I could not I could never sit and talk to him because we would be talking about music and singers and all these wonderful details. And this day he said, I think I just wrote a song for the CD, listen to this. And he started singing to me over the phone a song called Comet Ride. And I just parked the car because there was no way you could drive. <laughs> and I'll warn you, there are parts of that CD where you do need your Kleenex, and there are other parts where you better make sure you have your cruise control set if you're in your car, because if Run Mississippi's playing, you're going to get a ticket. <laughs> and Comet Ride just commanded my attention. I, pull, I just parked right there in the middle of the parking lot, and I couldn't move as he sang it and played it on my little phone. And I said, oh, Carl, that's the song to end the CD. It ends the CD. It's the most beautiful thing. So... That's how we ended it, and then with the little narration track that I'm going to play for you in a minute here. I have to tell you a quick story about um, the voice of Twain. Are you surprised to hear Dirty Harry as Mark Twain? <laughs> <laughs> Did it make your day like it made mine? Yeah. I can't get enough of that little pun. I'm going to use that all the time. We, we couldn't believe this, uh, the good fortune of, this, of everything, how everybody we asked, everybody we asked, jumped up and said, yes, yes, sign me up. I want to help. I want help from Brad Paisley with Huck Finn Blues, everybody. Now, I had told you I had two wishes. One was for Carl to produce, and one was for Jimmy to somehow be involved, Jimmy Buffett to be involved. I had no idea about Clint Eastwood. I, I couldn't predict that. I thought Garrison Keillor would fit right in. I mean, he's such a great storyteller. I could hear him doing the narration, and I just didn't know how it was all going to play out, but I just knew... Somehow felt as though Sam Clemens had a hand in the whole thing, I will tell you that. And uh, 
I sent the script down to Jimmy Buffett's assistant in Key West. Now, what are the odds? I know he's one of the busiest guys in show business. And he's always on the road. He's always doing great philanthropic deeds. And what are the odds? But the other part of me was the twiniac inside me. I know that Jimmy Buffett is a twiniac. This man has written three songs just about following the equator along. He mentions Mark Twain in all of his books. And I thought, what kind of a Twain fan would I be to put together a little project like this and not at least invite him? Of all the people out there, he should be invited. So I called her and I said, this is what we're doing. And I don't know who will all be on it. I don't know what all to expect. But as far as credentials, Carl is a Grammy Award winning producer, musician, songwriter, singer. And I you know, I know a little bit about Mark Twain, so I'm going to write the narrative. Or I had written it at that point. I said, I just didn't want Jimmy Buffett to see this CD someday, to pick it up somewhere in his travels and say, Gee, a Mark Twain CD, why, why didn't they ask me to be involved? Because I just thought that would be a slap in his face. I never expected him to get involved because he is a very busy man. But I had to ask him. That was something I, I had to do. So I, I, I pitched it to her and she said, send me the script. He was coming to play a concert in St. Louis. And I bought a ticket and I said, well, I'm going to be at this concert if he'd like to talk about it. Now, what are the odds of that, right? Mm -hmm. But you put it out there, if he'd like to talk about it, I'll be there. And I really wanted to talk to him about this Twain project. Well, she sent me, um, she sent me two, she emailed me and she said, I've got two passes for you to go back to this little party they had before the show. Well, I only had one ticket. So I was just going to go by myself and see the concert and hope to meet Jimmy and come home. So I called my son in Florida. My son used to be an ocean lifeguard, and it was actually Jimmy Buffett who got my son to read Mark Twain. It was not I. Mm -hmm. And so I called my son. I said, you have to come up for this concert. He said, Mom, I've got to work. I said, you've got to come. This is your one chance. You've got to come. So he literally flew up on a Thursday and flew back on a Friday. But the day he flew up, I was at the museum that morning when Jimmy Buffett's assistant called me from Key West. And she said, well, I'm, you know, all these years, 25 years I've worked with Jimmy, she said, this is a first. And I said, what? And I thought, was I already banned from the concert oh, no. for being a stalker? <laughs> I was a little nervous when she said that. But she said, he really loves this project and he'd like to meet with you tonight. Well, that's all I wanted. It was just a chance, just a chance. He'd read the script and by golly, my son and I got to meet him that night. And I will tell you, he was so nice and so gracious and we talked Twain the whole time. So all we talked about was Mark Twain. He loves Mark Twain. And he said, you know, I want to be involved in help in some way. And he not only came on board as the voice of Huckleberry Finn, and he does a fine Huckleberry, he also put the CD on his record label. So it's on his label, Mailboat Records, which has just been wonderful for us. So that's how Jimmy got involved. Brad Paisley was working with Clint Eastwood, and that's why I asked you, were you surprised to hear Dirty Harry on there? Brad was working with Clint on their project, and just through the conversation it came up, and uh, Brad talked to Carl, and next thing you know, he's talking to Clint, and Clint said, I would very much like to play Mark Twain, but only if you've already asked Hal Holbrook. <laughs> <laughs> Professional courtesy. And, and I thought it was very gentlemanly and very um, you know, respectful of Clint Eastwood. Those two men have worked together, of course, on an old Dirty Hair movie, I think on the original. So they're old friends, I'm sure. And I had asked Hal. Hal was one of the very first people I'd asked. But as he explained, you know, he is a performance actor and not a voice actor, and he wished us well with the project, and that's how it came to be. We were able to say to Clint Eastwood, yes, we have asked Hal, and he can't do the project for these reasons, and so there you have it. So we ended up with Clint Eastwood, Jimmy Buffett, and all these other wonderful voices, even the great Angela Lovell, which I'm very proud of. <laughs> and what I'd like to do now is kind of, kind of, hopefully have kind of sketched out for you a little imagination of how it goes. It's this chronological order of his life. And I'd like for you to hear how it ends with Comet Ride written by Carl Jackson, sung by Ricky Skaggs, and then going out with the closing narrative. Got to get the right tracks. <laughs> Technology. And I'm glad I put Dusty on this and not me. <laughs> Thanks, Dusty. <laughs> Good for number 12, I think.
so there ain't nothing more to write about, and I'm rotten glad of it. If I know what the trouble it was to make a book, I wouldn't attack it. And ain't gonna do it no more. But I reckon I gotta lie out for the territory ahead of the rest. Because Aunt Sally, she's gonna adopt me and civilize me. And I can't stand it. I've been there before.
Well, I can't thank you enough for letting me share this with you tonight. And uh, Barb does have them for sale on the back. And I think she's going to take it over and talk about cake and all the other good stuff. Thank you, Barb.